where Katie is going to put me in the hot seat and ask me some questions. That Hard hitting questions. <laughs> so let's see, let's see how hot this seat can get. So Katie, how do you want to kick us off with this uh, rapid fire interview? Absolutely. Um, okay. So our first question is from Andrea. And so okay. Andrea wants to know about the key to writing phenomenal learning outcomes that are specially focused on that action verb with Bloom's taxonomy. It's a great question. Okay. Good one, Andrea. So when we're talking about writing really good quality learning objectives, um, I say this a lot. So you may have heard me say this before already, but your learning objectives are really kind of like the destination that you want to take your learner on or where you want to get them to. So when they come into your program, they have a starting point and then your learning objectives are where you're trying to get them to. Right. So for that to be a really good destination, it needs to be specific and it needs to be measurable. So you need to be able to measure that they got there and you need to be very specific about where it is that you're taking them. And then specifically, whenever we're talking about Bloom's taxonomy and using those verbs, my suggestion to you, I have a couple of suggestions, actually. My suggestion would be is that you avoid those two lower levels on blooms. So whenever we're talking about remember and understand and using verbs like define and things like that, well, those are kind of implied in those upper level blooms, uh, those upper levels of the bloom taxonomy. So in order for you to be able to synthesize something, you already have to understand it. You have to know what it means. So if you think about it from that perspective, whenever you go higher on blooms, there is this implied understanding that they know those lower levels. So that's one piece of advice. And then the other thing would be is because this is a destination and it's specific and it's measurable, avoid double barreled learning objectives. And what I mean by a double barreled learning objective is that it's measuring two different things, right? So that often happens whenever you say define and describe or uh, understand and apply. So if you're using two verbs in it, most of the time that's double barreled and you want to avoid that. All right. Great. Next Great. question. All right. We still got another one from Andrea. It was kind of a double part there. Okay. Um, so what would you say is an average or a good number of outcomes per module? Um, mm -hmm. So you did a couple ways, like maybe lessons per module, but really for your learning outcomes, how many should be tied to each module? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's another really good question. So this is one of those that it depends. So there's not a one size fits all. Every single learning solution that you build is going to be different. It's going to be different in length. It's going to be different in complexity. So your learning objectives are going to be different in the number that you have, right? Um, I mean, there are some things that you would want to avoid. If you have a 15 minute lesson, you wouldn't want to have five learning objectives. It really comes down to how much can a learner really learn and be able to demonstrate at the end of that module or that lesson? So you're going to size the number of learning objectives based on what you want them to learn, the complexity of the topic, and um, the length. Yeah, that's a good one. Definitely. Um, and then Tamara asked, do you recommend the same process? You're referring back to our back to school challenge and we mm -hmm went through learning objectives and we did a learner persona and we kind of followed this process. Do you recommend using that same process for designing all courses or classes, no matter how long they are? Um, or are there different steps for maybe say like a year long course or a very short course, um, like an hour long? What would you say is a good uh, in terms of steps? I don't know if the word same-ish is yeah. a real word. <laughs> I like it. Same-ish. Like um, we definitely skipped some steps whenever we went to, whenever we entered into this challenge because we had a very short amount of time and we were only able to um, discuss concepts in a very brief manner. So we skipped like the whole analysis phase. I mean, we truly skipped that. We didn't have any kind of kickoff. We didn't have a meeting with our business owners or our stakeholders to really dig into their goals for the training. Um, we didn't really get into the to the purpose of the training or the outcomes. Like we created some, but we didn't tie those to any business objectives or business targets or anything like that. So 
it's same ish because once we go through that analysis phase, then yes, then we would go back, refine our learning outcomes, lay those out, look at the big picture. Even if it was a, a, a year long program, we would take a step back, look at what it is that we needed to cover over that 12 month period you know, how, what the cadence of that is, what the learning objectives are for each of those different modules. So we would have done more, but the, the general principles that we used would be the same. We would just have a little bit more that we would add to that. Yeah. So, so we like different. assumed that we had all that information and we were just kind yes. of working for it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to throw a softball question in here. Oh boy. To pepper that in. So here's, okay. here's, are you ready? Um, so what would you say is your superpower Ooh. as a designer my superpower i know what i would say yours is but i want to know <laughs> uh, my superpower <laughs> as an instructional designer um i would say that it is i can really absorb like massive amounts of information and kind of synthesize all of that really quickly and then break it down in a way that is easy for people to relate to and understand. And they're like, oh, okay, I get that. So I'd say that my superpower is like taking a whole bunch of information that people throw at me and then structuring it in a way that makes sense to my learners. Yes, yes. I would say also that you have this great review eye, things that I would not see things that I've looked at a million times. Shante can pick it out. She's got, she's my reviewer. If I'm going to pick anybody, she's the one. <laughs> That's what I would definitely say is her superpower. Oh, okay. In addition cool. to all those things for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it shows in, your pro in our program as well. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. So I got another question here from Tashania. I hope I'm saying that right. Sorry. Um, so you know, she says that um, I noticed that your curriculum has articulate. So, um, so referring to the accelerator program that mm -hmm. includes articulate, um, would we have to pay for that software separately or do you also go over captivate um, as a software? Okay. Yeah, that's another great question. So the good news is, is that Articulate Storyline 360 has this really amazing free trial. So if you choose to become one of our accelerators and join me inside the Instructional Design and Tech Accelerator program, I will ask you to wait to begin that free trial. I don't, I know that you may want to like jump into it right away because you'll be really excited, but I'll ask you to wait. And sometimes that wait part is hard but I will cue you along the way. Um, one, it will be in our modules, but we, again, we do those weekly Facebook Live trainings and Q&A sessions. So I'll cue you in one of those sessions to be like, okay, so this is the week that I want you to go and initiate that trial. And then that trial has plenty of time for us to get through everything that we need to get through and for you to actually build some of those lessons for your portfolio. So there is zero cost for that unless, and let me just put this disclaimer out there, if you are a PC user, you will not have to pay anything to have Articulate Storyline 360. If you are a Mac user like me or like Joni, then you're going to have to run something like Parallels, which allows you to have a dual operating system so that you can run Articulate Storyline 360 on your Mac. All right. Yep. So you don't have to. Um, you don't have to pay for you don't have to pay for articulate storyline 360. I can tell you and Shawnice, I don't know if you're here in the chat with us or not, but Shawnice, what she chose to do when in our accelerator program was she first chose to work in articulate rise because she also had a Mac and she didn't want to run parallels not yet anyway. So she started working in articulate rise and took advantage of that free trial and still work through all the modules and everything. So that's yeah. another option for you. That's and a great then, one. Yeah, that was, I thought yeah. that was a really good way of handling it too. Yeah. And then as far as Captivate, no, we don't address Captivate here. Not We've considered adding in some different lessons for Captivate, but here's the thing. Whenever you go into a workspace, if you know Articulate Storyline 360 really well, making that transition into Captivate is going to be so much easier because you've already got the foundation. So I wouldn't worry about it. Learn one, learn one really, really well. And then it's very easy to then pick up a second tool. 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I love Rise as a Mac user. Articulate Rise is a really cool um, part of that. Like it's all online. It's, very, it's a very neat um, part to add. Yep. So Jessica also at, dropped in four different questions. So okay. she, was, she really took rapid fire. This is the Jessica show. Let's go. And she wants to know. So here's her hard hitting question. So number one, um, what's the best platform that an, an aspiring um, instructional designer can use to build a portfolio? What would you recommend for putting that portfolio out there? Any free one. Yeah. Find a free one that you like, right? At this point, you don't want to spend a ton of money going out to showcase your skills. So if you already have your own website for some reason, I know that there are many people out there that have their own website, then you could house your resources on one of your pages on your website. But then there are things like Wix or Google Sites that you could very easily build a portfolio on. Or if you want to have some added features and, and you want a little bit more robust of a portfolio and you don't mind paying a few dollars every month, then you could go with something like Adobe portfolio. If you have Creative Cloud, then you've got that included. Or, you know, there's many different ones out there that you could pay for. But my recommendation is that you start with free. And then if you feel that you need more along the way, then you can upgrade to something else. Yeah, agree. I think I used we Weebly for a long time. It was mm -hmm. super free. So yeah, there's a ton out there that would be great. Yeah. E Google Sites would be super easy as well. All right. Yeah, number two. Oh, sorry. Accelerator. We use, we use yeah. Google Sites and Accelerator. Yep. That'd be a great one. Number two, what is what are the most worthwhile and inexpensive authoring tools that an aspiring instructional designer needs to learn? Worthwhile, inexpensive, or inexpensive are yep. probably two different <laughs> tools. <laughs> That's true. Um, so worthwhile. Okay. If we're breaking this into instructional designer in e-learning, okay, let's break it that way. Yep. So if we're talking about instructional design, I mean, you really need some basic tools, like some kind of slide tool, like PowerPoint Keynote or um, Google Slides, you know, some kind of Word tool, you know, maybe some access to some free images on Unsplash or Pexels or using Canva or something like that on the instructional design side. And you need a project management tool. Because, and again, I'd go for a free one, especially at this point. You could do Trello or something like that, or even ClickUp has some free, um, free access. So I would go with free. I would start with free because whenever you get a job, they're going to pay for all of your tools. So until you get the job, I would go with the free tools, the free trials. Now on the e-learning side, again, I'm going to, I'm going to direct you back to articulate because if you go, if I don't know if you have seen Andrea, my post-it note party where I encourage you to go and like figure out all the different skills and tools that are listed on, on four or five different job postings that are interesting to you. My bet is that whenever you go through that process that you're going to see articulate um, mentioned many times. So I would go there, but then there are other things like there's ice spring, right? There's some add ons to PowerPoint that can easily convert a PowerPoint into an e-learning tool. Or, you know, another form of e-learning that's not for an LMS, so to speak, but like you could do the voiceover of PowerPoint and you can export it as a video. So there's quite a few things that you can do to convert something into e-learning at a pretty low cost. Yep. Yep, definitely. And then best books and resources for someone that's more self-taught um, in mm -hmm. instructional design. What would be my favorite book, Katie? I know. Training from the back of the room. Yes. That's my yes. favorite. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's a really great book. And it, it is, it's really about leading training and um, getting your learners to interact with the content and lead conversations. So you may be thinking that how does that apply to instructional design, Shante? Well, if you get the book, you will know because it is loaded with really great tips about instructional design and how to structure content, how to write content, how to maximize learning. So that's a really great book. Um, there are other ones like, you know, Design for How Learners Learn is another good one. Um, if you're on the e-learning side, Tim Slade's got a really great book out there that you can flip through and read through. It's a very easy read. He did a really great job of, of breaking it down so that it's understandable. But aside from books, I would recommend that you follow some blogs, right? Follow our blog on the Instructional Design Company. 
check out Christy Tucker, check out Kathy Moore. They're constantly, and we are too, we're always putting out more information related to instructional design that can help you grow um, as, as you're developing uh, your instructional, de instructional design and e-learning uh, skills. Yes, and I will drop the names of those books into the comments after after this, um, just so you can have them written down. But Training from the Back of the Room is a great one, like Shantae said, uh, Design for How People Learn. I'm also in the middle of one by Peter C. Brown, just called Make It Stick, which is yep. a great book um, about like learning and also balancing that with storytelling, because that's really part of the job. So just um, free plug there. That's also a, a great one. Awesome. And then um, another question here from Jessica and her for rapid fire. Great job here. Uh, what are good transitional job roles for a teacher who is an aspiring ID? So someone maybe in the middle still teaching maybe and still trying mm -hmm. to take on a few like somewhere in that middle point before mm -hmm. they stop teaching. Yes. So this is a great question too. Like if you're not ready to take the plunge into instructional design and e-learning, a great transitional job that really allows you to leverage your teaching skills is a job like training or a facilitator, right? If you could find, if you go and you search for training jobs, and I'm not talking about the creator of the training, but the person who stands at the front of the room and delivers the training, the facilitator, that's a really good transitional job because it allows you to leverage your facilitation skills from being in front of the classroom your class management skills, your engaging of your audience and, and, you know, doing different activities. So that's a really good transitional job until you're ready to take that plunge into instructional design and e-learning. Yep, definitely, definitely. And then this kind of would also help answer that question uh, from Pat John, which is how to market yourself to maybe small colleges and universities if you want to be an independent contractor. So this also maybe help with that last question as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So for Pat John, and, and just so that everyone else here knows, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to Pat John a little bit more directly, and it may be vague to you, but he's going to know because I know who one of Pat John's current um, contracts or who he is currently contracting with. So I have a little insider information on this one. So um, Pat John, what I would say in this case is in the role that you currently have as a contractor, I would encourage you to build relationships with your subject matter experts because many of those subject matter experts are also working for other universities. And so if you have a really good experience with those subject matter experts, then they might refer you whenever they hear that that university is looking for another instructional designer. So in addition to that, I would also recommend that you look at university job boards and see if they have any postings for instructional designers or contract instructional designers. Look at some of the higher education job posting boards as well. Perfect. Yes. Great one. I'm going to throw another softball question in here. So um, what does your day look like as the CEO of your own ID company? What, <laughs> what is that like for you to kind of... Oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> so um, my day looks like I get up early every day. So I'm part of the 5 a.m. club. So good for you. Good for you. <laughs> um, I start my day at five. Um, I have one of these uh, in my intent bracelets. I don't know if you guys ever see it. So it talks about rise at five and stop at five. I have yet to stop at five because my day just doesn't end at five. Um, I stay really, really busy throughout the day. I mean, we, in my role, I'm always working with um, new pr prospective clients or I'm doing coaching or I'm serving as a consultant, um, working with Katie, right? We, we have our daily stand up every day, working with our other contractors, you know, looking at writing job descriptions for new roles that we are hiring for, looking at how we can improve our accelerator program, what more, you know, what value adds can we bring into that and then just you know there's the daily grind stuff right there's billing there is balancing the books there is um forecasting goal setting you know so it, there's a lot of different things that we are constantly doing if i ever sat down and thought about it all about it all at once that might be overwhelming but i literally just like block it into chunks like okay i gotta do this or okay i gotta do that so 
it doesn't ever seem that bad. Yeah, that was a selfish question for me about how you do it all. <laughs> how does this all happen? But And then our last question here from Lauren, uh, do you have to be a creative writing genius to be a good instructional designer? I love this question. I have a bachelor's in graphic design, mm -hmm. but wouldn't consider myself to be a wordsmith um, because there is a lot of writing involved, finessing. So what would you recommend yeah. there? You know, it's funny because I come from a line of very, very creative, artistic women. And I did not get that very, very creative, artistic gene. So <laughs> I knew that face was going to go. But <laughs> what I am really, I mean, again, I'm good at like taking a lot of information and like breaking it down into a way that is relatable to other people to consume and digest. But I'm not like over the top creative and like, oh, you know, I can imagine this really amazing thing and let's go do that. Katie's really good at that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Nah. Someday we'll have to tell you about our <laughs> video. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Lauren, to answer your question, I don't think you have to be the most creative genius out there to be a good instructional designer. What I think you need to be is a, a lover of learning and you need to constantly be pouring into yourself, learning new ways um, of designing learning, seeing how other people are designing learning, taking the ideas that you think are like, oh, those are really great. And, you know, putting those in your memory bank so that, you know, when when something comes along that, you know, that particular strategy or interaction might be a good fit, you can be like, oh, yeah, I remember and then you you have something to pull from because your experience set or your knowledge set is so big because you have read and um, looked at different demos and, and experienced other learning solutions. So that's I think that's really what it comes down to yeah. is being a lover of learn, learning, always looking to see what other people are doing and how they're doing it. And then just thinking about how you can apply those things in your learning solutions. Yes. Yeah, I would agree. Seeing as much as possible and then applying whatever works for you, mm -hmm. throwing it in there. Yes, it definitely helps. So last question here, um, which is what I've always wanted to know deep down in my little heart. Uh -oh. If you could go back and talk to Shantae 15 years ago when she was jumping from teaching to training and instructional design, what is one thing that you would tell her? I probably just don't <laughs> take it all so seriously. You know, I yeah. mean, my younger self was like, these are the rules. You must follow the rules. There's no deviation of the rules. But in reality, there's no such thing as rules. They're all like the pirate's code. They're more like guidelines than they are, you know, like hard facts, right? So even things like, especially in instructional design and, and you all, for my experienced instructional designers and e-learning developers, this may resonate with you. And for the newbies who are just getting into this, you have let you have yet to experience this. But in the beginning, I'm like, this is how you do it. This is what all the books say that you're supposed to do. This is the best practice. Or you're a failure because you're not doing it. Yeah. This like, yeah. If you would just do what I say, this would be amazing. Yes. Well, the reality is like all of this is about best practice. It's a starting point. Yep. So you know what the best practice is, but then you've got to take others along on a journey to help them see what that best practice is and what the benefit of following that is, right? So you can't just expect that you're going to sit down in a meeting with a subject matter expert and go, this is how it should be done. And they're going to be like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Now, sometimes that does happen, but not very often. Uh, most of the time we have to take them on a journey. And my younger self was just always so aggravated about like, this is wrong. And I know it's wrong. Why are we building it wrong? And, but now my older self is like, all right, that's better than what it would have been without my help in it. Right. So let me yeah. get them as far as I can get them. And then the next time that we do this together, I will take them a little bit further. Yeah. Great answer. Great answer. Well, thank you. That's all. It concludes all of our questions for today. Oh We're coming up on that 30 minutes. And thank you, Shante, for kind of letting us um, just get deep in there and, and for you guys all to see that um, how I and she is my sage and my yoga and my sensei uh, of all things. 
because uh, she's got all the right answers. No, I just make them up when I don't. <laughs> and then <laughs> I just do a great job. Back, right? a great job.